uh, welcome back to this course on infrastructure finance. This is lecture 35. We will continue our discussion on risk management and specifically focus on country and political risks uh, even in this lecture as well. Before we go on to the topic of um, today, we will try and spend some time to discuss the thought questions that we had in the previous lecture. And um, if you go back to the question, the question that we had was uh, what were the problems with uh, creeping expropriation type of actions? Uh, generally, if you look at um, creeping expropriation, what did we actually look at creeping expropriation is uh, these are all very small actions um, taken by the government. So if you look at it, each and every action individually would not have any substantial impact of the project. What were some of the examples of uh, the creeping expropriation actions that we, uh, that we talked about? See, for example, um, it could be some kind of delays in issuing permits for the project. It could be uh, in terms of uh, holding up uh, stocks at the, uh, at the docks, either in terms of export or in terms of import. Or it could be in terms of um, some tax uh, related investigations. Or it could be in terms of um, some investigations uh, started against the management and so on. So these are all, um, you know, individually these are all um, uh, very small actions. But then if you look at it cumulatively, um, they can actually have a substantial impact on the uh, benefit of the project. So therefore, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, really look at uh, what do we actually mean by creeping expropriation, right? uh, whether they're all um, genuine issues uh, which the government is going to take an action or these are all uh, issues which are, which are in the nature of, uh, uh, you know, trying to create a, a very unfavorable condition for the project. And more importantly, these kinds of uh, actions are going to be very difficult to uh, define in advance. See, one of the major uh, feature of an insurance contract as compared to uh, the traditional contract between two parties is the fact that one should be in a position to define very clearly what are the events. Right? Unless until um, it, one, is, one is not able to define clearly what are the events, that will actually uh, you know, result in uh, you know, a claim being filed, it is going to lead to a lot of um, uh, disputes uh, in the case of insurance claims. So in the case of a conventional contract, uh, you know, not all of the events are uh, well defined, uh, most of it is well defined, but there are several gray areas which needs to be handled as and when they arise. So therefore, in a typical contractual situation, we have what is called as a dispute resolution mechanism. Very often such dispute resolution mechanisms are called uh, when there is a dispute that cannot be settled amicably between the two contracting parties. So in the case of an insurance, such disputes are going to be uh, much fewer as compared to what we see in a traditional contract. And uh, how can the disputes be uh, fewer? Uh, it can be fewer only when the events that can actually result uh, in an insurance claim being filed are being very clearly defined. Not only they are very clearly defined, they should be in a position to be able to um, estimate it in advance. But in a creeping expropriation kind of an uh, action, uh, it's going to be very difficult to determine what are the different uh, actions um, that will be under the uh, umbrella of creeping expropriation. Or uh, it will be very difficult to even recognize it till it has actually taken place. So because of these factors, you know, the insurance uh, in this sector is going to be uh, very difficult. See, normally what happens is there is going to be a lot of trust between the project company and the government in terms of you know, smooth uh, functioning of the project company. So unless until that trust is, um, is not there, it's going to be very difficult for the project to function. But sometimes the governments can actually misuse uh, the trust and can actually you know, uh, deliberately uh, do some actions that can actually benefit the, uh, that can actually harm the project. So there is no clear boundary between the legitimate use of state power or deliberate harassment of the project. So how do we actually say that it is for a legitimate reason that the imports and exports are being held at the docks? Um, how do we uh, say that, uh, that the, the delay in the issue of permits is because of some certain valid reasons? Or you know, it's also possible that the government wants to extract um, something from the project company and therefore it is uh, delaying giving some permits. So the boundary becomes um, very clear and we are not able to say for sure whether the state is, is following its, you know, uh, the rules as per um, you know, the legitimacy that it has been interested upon or it is trying to result in actions that can deliberately you know, harm the project uh, company. And uh, it is also going to be very difficult to prove that the project would not have defaulted on its payments uh, if these creeping expropriation actions acts had not taken place. 
Okay. So, uh, when we actually claim uh, an insurance, what do we actually indicate, right? That the project has been a, has not been able to honor its payments because these actions have taken place. So that's a if there is uh, if there is let us say an earthquake or if there is a sabotage, then it is going to be very clear to uh, identify that the project have not been able to function because of these actions. But it is going to be very difficult to prove that in the case of a creeping expropriations. How are we to prove that? That it is because of these actions that the project has not been able to um, honor its commitments. Because it is going to be so difficult to establish a causal relationship uh, between the occurrence of the event and the non-payment uh, uh, non payment to debtors or investors, it is also going to be very difficult uh, to actually file a creeping expropriation. So, these are some of the challenges and uh, if you are actually going to take uh, a loan for uh, insurance for creeping expropriation, then we need to be aware of um, these kinds of difficulties and therefore, uh, some of the events have to be lot more clearly defined to ensure that the disputes after the event has occurred is uh, very minimal. Okay, now, let us continue our discussion on uh, political risk. Um, in the previous lectures, we have talked about um, the various uh, types of political risk and the impacts that it can actually have. Now, we will move to uh, the next part of it that is uh, after having identified what is political risk, after having identified the different forms of political risk, let us see how we can actually go about and mitigating them. So, we even looked at uh, specific instances of mitigating political risk. For example, if you look at uh, one of our earlier lectures, we talked about um, investment risk. Under investment risk, we talked about currency convertibility and repatriation and um, under that we said uh, some there are some specific strategies that project companies follow to mitigate this investment risk. Um, so, one of it is enclave projects uh, that is you actually uh, uh, create a project where the cash flows uh, actually come in an account that is set up overseas and we also looked at setting up of overseas reserve accounts. It could be overseas expenditure account, it could be overseas debt service reserve account and so on. So, these are some of the ways uh, that we briefly looked at in terms of mitigating the political risk. So, in this lecture, we talked about other um, mechanisms by which we can mitigate uh, political risk. The first is what is called as a government support agreement. Okay. In fact, uh, this is one of the important contracts um, that a project company executes and uh, this is an agreement uh, which uh, with the government and the project company is stating that uh, the government will create a favorable uh, environment for the project company. Okay. So, uh, there are uh, various ways in which a uh, you know, government can actually you know, facilitate uh, the functioning of the project company and the government support agreement is essentially um, for that purpose. In fact, a government support agreement can actually take various forms as we will um, uh, see later. But uh, the essence of it is very clear. The essence of it is um, there is some kind of an agreement with the government uh, by the project company to ensure that it is able to function in a, a fairly smooth way. But there is a view that uh, you know the government support agreements are uh, essential uh, only when there is no legal framework for the project. So, there is a general law of the country that sets up the framework for the project, there is no need for uh, government support um, uh, agreement. So, this essentially means that uh, when do we need a government support agreement? We need a government support agreement when the private sector finance is being used for the first time and there are some particular local risk that needs to be considered. And uh, when we actually have a support from the um, host government, it reduces the risk and encourages development that would otherwise not take place. Okay. So, this is, uh, this is a broad principle. So, we can see several uh, instances of uh, you know, how do we actually, uh, 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 several instances of government support agreement being used. Let us say for example, the Indian power sector, when the Indian power sector was thrown open uh, for um, a private sector investment. At the time, there was no regulatory authority. At the time, there was, you know, no history of uh, uh, foreign investment coming in the Indian power sector and so on. So, the framework today that we have in terms of regulatory authority, in terms of facilitating foreign investment and so on evolved over time. But uh, for the government did not wait uh, for the framework to be developed uh, before getting investment. You know, both of the things in some sense happened parallelly. And when there is no history, when there is no uh, law or regulatory framework, obviously the support from the government becomes very critical for the investors. Today, if you are really looking at private sector investment, uh, the kind of support that the government gives is much, much less uh, as compared to what it was um, in the early 1990s. So, 
this is just to indicate that yes, the, the role of the government support agreement becomes very important in the early stages of getting private sector investment when the law um, is evolves, when the regulatory environment evolves and so on. So today if you really look at the telecom sector, we do not really get a government support agreement because there has been a long history of private sector companies operating um, in, a, in a smooth fashion um, in the country. So if the country becomes a lot more evolved, uh, if the country uh, gets a lot more experience in attracting private, uh, private finance in different sectors, the government support agreement uh, is, is, is not needed. Okay. Now there are also different uh, uh, forms of um, uh, government support agreement. Right? So today uh, if you really look at it, I will take the example of uh, the Bangalore International Airport Limited. So in the Bangalore International Airport Limited, the government support agreement is essentially to provide some kind of funding support for the project because um, the private sector is um, funding for the entire project might make it one uh, unviable. So therefore, the project needed some kind of subsidized capital from the government and therefore, um, the support agreement, the state support agreement was essentially uh, with the objective of providing some capital for the project. Okay. Now, the, there was an agreement um, uh, between the project company and the state government for providing that kind of uh, support. Right. So, the support could be not just in terms of creating a favorable environment, it, call, it could also be in terms of uh, providing capital. But then the question uh, really comes is uh, you know the, the government support agreement is all is fine, but is the government in a position to honor the obligations um, of the support agreement when the time comes. So all this agreement and all of these things is uh, actually undertaken before let us say the financial close, but should there be any difficulty uh, in the future, will the government be in a position to honor the terms of the contract. So the project company then follows various strategies uh, by which the government support agreement uh, uh, clauses are being enforced. Let us say for example in the case of Bangalore International Airport, the issue was the state has actually given an agreement uh, for providing funding support and this funding support occurs over a period of time and it is in line with the amount of investment that is actually been uh, brought, brought in by the, private, uh, by, the pri by the private investors. But always the doubt is what happens if the state government is not able to provide its funding support on time. Okay. What happens if the um, uh, state government um, uh, changes or what happens uh, if the state does not have the resources uh, to provide the support that it is indicated. So to overcome these uncertainties, um, what the project company has done is the project company has actually got a bank guarantee uh, from one of the largest banks in the, in the country. So the bank guarantee states that if the state government is not, is not in a position to actually um, you know, provide the funding as indicated in the state support agreement, then the bank guarantee will make do the commitment of the uh, uh, for the state government. So this is in a way in which the state supports agreement is enhanced by some level of guarantees. So in this case it is a very large um, national bank. There are other ways in which um, you know the you know the strength of the government support agreement is enhanced. Let us say for example um, the agreement is with the state government. In the case of the power sector um, you know we talked about the example of an Enron project. So, in the case of an Enron project, um, the state government uh, made a support agreement indicating that it will actually purchase the power that the power company has generated and then it will pay the tariffs on time. So, that is a government from, that is a support agreement from the state. But then there could always be a possibility of the state government reneging on um, the commitment. So, the project company wanted to enhance the credibility of um, uh, the state support agreement. So therefore, uh, it said that um, there has to be a counter guarantee by the federal government or that is by the central government. So the central government guarantee actually has a lot more weightage, has a lot more credibility as compared to um, the state support agreement and therefore, for the first few projects, um, the private power projects in, that happened in India, the government of uh, India also gave a counter guarantee. So this substantially strengthens the, um, the government support agreement at the state level. So there are several ways in which um, uh, project companies try and strengthen the uh, support agreements uh, from the government. What are the typical provisions in a government support agreement? Um, the guarantee could be on key contracts that is uh, 
let us say if there is a, a guarantee, uh, uh, if there is an agreement between let us say the state electricity board and the power generation company, the guarantee could be that uh, the state electricity board will fulfill its obligations as an off taker. This is not a guarantee provided in terms of uh, you know ensuring the obligations of the off taker. The second provision could be uh, you know create conditions uh, that prevents a project from being affected by non convertibility or non repatriation of the dividends. Obviously, if there are overseas investors they need to get returns. So, the government support agreement will provide for some provisions um, that will prevent uh, you know either non convertibility or reduce the chances of this non convertibility or non repatriation of the dividends. Or it could be also to create um, favorable institutional conditions such as issuing permits on time, uh, such as ensuring that exports and in imports are cleared on time, ensuring that all the paperwork is uh, you know with the support of the government, the government provides um, the necessary uh, support structure. For example, if you need to create roads, if you need to create um, utility connections at the project side, all of this is beyond the control of the project company, but um, the government will ensure that um, these are all uh, provided on time. So, these are all creating uh, supportive institutional conditions. Uh, you know, it could also be in terms of uh, provision of tax concessions, okay. Um, in, the, in the initial stages of the project, uh, creating a favorable tax structure so that uh, uh, private investment uh, comes in, okay. So, uh, that again could be a feature of the government uh, support agreement. So, the tax concessions might not be uniform, it might not be for the industry as a whole, but it could be for a specific project um, for a specific duration. And uh, sometimes the government support agreement also kind of uh, has clauses which says that um, you know what should be the dispute resolution mechanism. So, given the fact that whenever there is a dispute and uh, if the disputes are going to be uh, you know uh, are going to be uh, you know discussed uh, within the country, then um, you know if the uh, host government is one of the parties uh, to the dispute, then it is going to be the private investors will feel that uh, it is going to it is it's not going to get a very fair um, uh, resolution. So, therefore, most of the government support agreement also provides for a dispute resolution mechanism that is outside of the country, right. So, either a jurisdiction is outside or either the arbitration uh, tribunal is also outside the host country. So, these are some of the typical provisions that you actually have in a government support agreement and government support agreement is one of the ways in which uh, uh, you know projects can try and mitigate the uh, political risk. So, the other ways in which uh, project companies try and uh, mitigate the political risk is uh, in, the, in the form of insurance and, and the finance market. So, there are four uh, ways in which uh, project companies use the insurance on the finance market. Um, the first is uh, to actually have guarantees or insurance to political risk. So, uh, <coughs> like we actually cover for uh, fire, like we actually cover for um, uh, damages uh, during construction and so on, you can actually also take an insurance cover for mitigating your political risk. And um, you know this risk um, can cover all the risk, uh, both political and commercial. So, if it covers all the risk, both political and commercial, it is called as a full cover. But if it covers only the political risk, it is called as only the political risk cover. See, what is the objective um, of uh, having this political risk cover? The objective of having this political risk cover is to ensure that the risk environment becomes manageable, the levels of risk is acceptable for private investors and therefore, they are comfortable and they are willing to actually come out with the uh, you know making investment. Okay. So, the insurance uh, reduces the risk factors uh, that is prevalent uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, in the case of uh, you know providing this, this kinds of insurance. So, another way to uh, get investment apart from providing insurance is you know in, you just provide the funding itself right and therefore, um, loans to the project company from lenders uh, that are prepared to accept the level of political risk. You know. So, the traditional uh, conventional private investors will not be comfortable with uh, certain level of political risk and therefore, they are demanding political uh, risk insurance. But then there could be some other investors who may be comfortable in investing with this level of political risk and therefore, uh, they can uh, directly provide funding, they can directly provide loans instead of actually asking for political risk insurance. Okay. So, uh, getting finance from those sources who are acceptable uh, to the levels of political risk is another way of mitigating political risk. And uh, political risk is not, uh, mitigating political risk is not only important for the lenders of the project, it is also important for the investors in the project that is the equity investors in the project. Okay. So, uh, we are really looking at uh, you know uh, trying to mitigate it uh, for all types of investors 
and we are looking at different different ways in which this can be mitigated. Now, let us try and discuss them uh, one by one. The main sources uh, for political risk cover and as well as for loans in difficult environments is basically uh, fourfold. One is you actually have the export credit agencies. The second is uh, you have financing and guarantee provided by uh, bilateral institutions. And uh, the third would be loans and guarantees from multilateral agencies. And then the fourth is uh, you have your private insurance market. So, let us look at the export credit agencies to start with. So, what are export credit agencies? Now, these are also, uh, these are also uh, denoted in the short form as ECA. Now, there is um, uh, each and every uh, country today um, have their own export credit agency. So, these export credit agencies are public sector institutions established in their respective countries to provide support for export. So, today in India, we have an export credit agency, it is called as the Exim Bank. Okay. So, when um, Indian producers want to actually export uh, their product, then uh, they actually use the services of the Exim Bank, because Exim Banks provide uh, financial and other forms of assistance to help the exporters to export their products. Okay. So, uh, these kinds of financial institutions are specifically uh, provided, uh, you know, set up to provide uh, support for um, exports. So, these export credit agencies can actually provide political risk cover uh, when equipment for the project is important. Okay. So, um, the, the important thing in this case is, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 it is largely for the equipment. Um, so, when you really look at the project, uh, a project company actually, uh, you know, needs uh, capital for uh, many types of activities. For example, you need to buy equipment, you need to, you need funding for different kinds of services, uh, you need uh, funding for design and so on and so forth. Right. But um, when you actually have export credit agency, the political risk cover uh, is largely for the equipment that the uh, project is important. Right. Uh, the ECS can provide um, uh, direct funding support or they can actually provide interest rate subsidies. So, the how it works is, uh, uh, so let us say you have uh, the EPC uh, you know, contractor who is uh, responsible for let us say uh, equipment and so on and then you have the project company so um, let us say the epc contractor provides the equipment and then you have the project company um, which will actually repay the equipment, right, in terms of um, your interest and your principal repayments. But now, uh, if the contracting company or if the equipment supplier um, finds the project company uh, to be uh, too risky or if the project company is exposed to political risk, then they may actually rely on uh, some kind of, uh, you know, political risk mitigation mechanism, okay. So, um, uh, so, what actually happens is uh, instead of a direct transaction between the project company and the EPC contractor, you actually have what is called as your export credit agency, right. You actually have an export credit agency and the export credit agency provides uh, a loan to the uh, project company and the project company in turn actually repays to the ECA by interest and um, uh, principal repayment and the ECA in turn, uh, you know, uh, pays back the uh, EPC contractor, right. So, this is a kind of an agreement that you have in export credit agency. Some raise because of political risk, if the project company is not able to uh, repay your uh, interest and principal, right, if it is not able to repay your interest and principal then the ECA will actually uh, ensure that the, the equipment supplier um, gets the amount um, that it is supposed to get from the uh, project company. So, this is a guarantee, this is a guarantee that in case of a political risk. Now, if the interest and principal repayment actually is not, is defaulted because of events other than political risk then the ECA um, cover might not be applicable. Now, there are various reasons why 
Um, there could be defaults. The defaults could be because of commercial risk. Commercial risk, either the project not functioning properly or either the project is getting delayed and so on and so forth. So, in those cases, the political risk by the ECA uh, will not be applicable. This risk is applicable only, this cover is applicable only in the case of uh, political risk. So, what you can actually have is that there could be different types of support. So, ECA can actually do, provide funding to the project company to finance its equipment or it can actually provide uh, interest rate subsidies to a commercial bank. Let us say for example, instead of, uh, instead of export credit agency, there is a commercial bank which is financing this transaction, but for a commercial bank to finance this transaction, the risk is not an acceptable level or it needs a higher return for the risk it assumes. Okay? Um, so, the export credit agency can actually provide interest rate subsidies to a commercial bank. So, instead of an easy export credit agency, if we have a commercial bank, then you know export credit agency can reduce the effective rate of interest by providing interest rate subsidies and by providing interest rate subsidies, it is also reducing um, let us say the interest burden on the project company. <coughs> So, broadly if you look at it, the support by export credit agency can be in two forms. One is to provide financial support and the other is to by way of um, uh, credit support. Okay. Uh, financing support is in way of um, uh, direct loans or it could be in terms of interest rate subsidies. Uh, credit support uh, is also provided by two ways in terms of direct loans or credit insurance for loans made by uh, private sector banks. So, uh, credit insurance in the sense that if there is a commercial bank which is actually providing a loan for the project company and um, ECA can actually provide a credit insurance stating that if the commercial bank is not getting payments on time because of default by the project company due to political risk, then the export credit agency will ensure that the payments due to the commercial bank are paid. So, that is a broad scheme by which uh, the export credit agencies work. When is uh, the default triggered, right? Um, we should also know there is a difference between uh, payment guarantee and the performance guarantee. When we actually have export credit agencies ensure the loans, an insurance payment is triggered only if the covered risk lead to a default in payment. Let us say for example, there is a delay um, in the plant, uh, you know, starting operations. And if this delay results in a default um, of the interest being paid, then the insurance will be triggered. On the other hand, let us say for example, the plant has begun operations and um, for a particular reason and for a particular period, the plant is not functioning at let us say uh, 80 percent or the plant is, plant is functioning only at 80 percent of the capacity. So, because of this, uh, the, the revenues might be lower and because of the revenues might be lower, uh, the company's profitability might be lower and so on. So, this is a performance issue. But even at um, you know at this lower performance level, if the project company is being able to meet um, the interest and principal payments, then the export credit agency insurance will not be triggered. Right? So the payments, uh, the insurance will be triggered only uh, when there is a default in payment. Okay? If there is any impact on performance uh, because of political risk or or even otherwise. That could not, this insurance will not be triggered. So, this is an important distinction that uh, we need to be aware of. This is not the case with let us say a guarantee from the equipment manufacturer. Now, an equipment manufacturer if the equipment is functioning beyond um, certain promised efficiency levels, then the performance guarantee gets triggered. Right? Uh, this is also very different from let us say an operating maintenance uh, contract where you also have performance guarantees. If the quality uh, is beyond a certain level, then some penalty mechanisms get triggered. But in the case of an insurance, only if there is a problem with the payment will the insurance get triggered. And uh, the payment coverage or the protection um, is uh, normally not uh, for 100 percent for the total insurance being covered. Let us say the total project cost, um, if you look at export credit agency, they will actually cover only the equipment cost. Okay? So, let us assume that out of 100 percent of the project cost, um, 80 percent is your uh, equipment cost. So, the coverage from the export credit agency will be only for this 80 percent. Okay? And for this 80 percent, the credit aging agencies will, power, will cover 95 percent of the risk. Let us say the total equipment cost is 80 million, 
then the export credit agency will cover uh, only for um, 76 million. The remaining 5 percent is expected to be a risk that is assumed by the lenders. So, they will not be able to provide a coverage for 100 percent, right. So, that is something that needs to be the lenders will have to assume certain level of risk. So, this is something that we also see uh, in our day to day life in many insurance. Let us say for example, in the case of the health insurance, um, in the case of the health insurance, uh, the, the insurance provider will not be in most cases uh, providing 100 percent of the health costs. Okay? There is something called as the co-payment where the patient is expected to pay 10 percent or 15 percent and then the remaining expenses are provided by um, the health insurance company. Okay? Uh, this also uh, can be seen in, in other forms of insurance, let us say in a vehicle insurance. Right? Let us say you have got a car and you have got a car insurance uh, protection and whenever you are actually uh, you know uh, filing um, an insurance claim, there are some deductibles, right. So, out of the total approved claim, the insurance company will going to reimburse only certain amount after a compulsory deduction. So, these are all uh, uh, you know mechanisms that will ensure that the lenders also assume a certain level of um, risk, okay. It is 100 percent of the risk is not going to be covered by these kinds of insurance schemes. And um, uh, ECAs also expect the commercial risk, uh, you know, to be borne by the uh, uh, commercial banks, right. So, for example, uh, uh, if there is a delay in completion, um, then that is actually a commercial risk, okay. So, the commercial banks are expected to, uh, you know, absorb those risks and not the export uh, credit rating agencies, okay. And particularly, uh, ECAs guarantee uh, only political risk uh, during the construction period because uh, the commercial risk is largely uh, you know managed by is largely governed by the EPC contracts and various other contracts. So, the project company or the EPC contractors are in a better position to manage this commercial risk rather than the um, export credit rating agencies. What are the general coverage of risk uh, by the export credit rating agencies? So, they look at uh, the standard investment risk, we discuss them, there is currency convertibility, uh, you know there is um, repatriation, uh, expropriation, political violence. So, these kinds of risks are actually covered by the export rating agencies. Some of the agencies do not provide coverage for uh, creeping expropriation. Remember, uh, creeping expropriation is difficult to define, though it is part of a political risk process. Um, sometimes it is going to be difficult to say what comes under creeping expropriation. So, not all of the ECAs provide cover for creeping expropriation. Then we also talk about breach of contract. Uh, breach of contract is when the government does not honor its side of the agreement. For example, there is a government support agreement and the government does not agree. Um, does not make payments or any any such um, uh, you know uh, events that may unfold. So, this actually a breach of contract. So, the export crediting agencies sometimes uh, do not provide for such a breach of contract. What is the overall view of the ECA cover? Um, we need to really look at some of the limitations and benefits of uh, the ECA cover. Uh, the limitation as we have seen earlier is they do not fully cover the amount of risk they are insuring and uh, second is uh, they generally cover only for equipment. See for example, if you look at a large construction project, a uh, construction project cost uh, is not only equipment, you know there is a lot of construction, there is a lot of design, there is a lot of development that needs to be done which is also accounting for a substantial percentage of the uh, project cost, but the ECA cover will be largely available only for equipment. And sometimes uh, the premiums charged for political cover uh, can be very high, okay. So, uh, you know it makes it attractive for commercial lenders um, uh, only, uh, you know, if they are not willing to provide finance otherwise, okay. So, if the risk is acceptable and the commercial lenders are willing to provide finance, then it may be better off to actually fund a um, you know, project without this political risk cover because of the cost that is involved. Some of the benefits of ECA cover is uh, whenever they actually provide funding assistance, the interest rates are low and not only that, the interest rate also fixed as well. So, it helps a project company to get an understanding of what is going to be the uh, overall um, interest outgo from the project. And then because of the fact that the ECAs are public sector institutions and um, uh, there is always, um, you know, uh, mutually 
a reciprocal relationship between one public sector institution vis-a-vis -vis, uh, government of the host country, then uh, it provides a degree of um, intangible political support. Okay, the next um, type of political uh, risk mitigation mechanism is uh, what we talked about is uh, funding from uh, bilateral agencies. So, then we also uh, describe it as the untied cover and financing. We call this export credit agency as a tight cover because it is largely related to uh, the equipment. Okay. Now, if you talk about bilateral lending, uh, we talk about um, bilateral lending agencies. These are all uh, development finance institutions um, that actually uh, you know provide certain amount of um, loans or they also make direct equity investments uh, in different countries. So, because of the fact that these are development finance institutions, they are able to assume certain level of political risk, which might not be able to be assumed by uh, private investors. So, they do not actually provide an insurance, but by investing um, in countries which having a high degree of political risk, they actually you know reduce the risk levels for the other investors in the project. Okay. But um, each and every organization has its limitations in terms of uh, the maximum amounts of investments. So, though the project might be very large, some of them might not be able to contribute beyond a certain level. Right? It also depends on the percentage of investment. So, there are limitations in terms of you know how much percentage of investment they will make, how much of absolute quantum of investment they will make and also in terms of uh, the time of coverage. How long will they be able to uh, provide um, you know funding? or coverage to the project, either it be 15 years or it is going to be 10 years and so on. Okay. But it also needs to be remembered that uh, many of those uh, require some level of involvement uh, from the country of the bilateral agency. Let us say for example, you have um, the overseas uh, you know private you know insurance corporation. Now, this is an organization of the US. So, whenever we are talking about support getting from OPEC, uh, it is assumed that a part of the equity is also uh, from the US investors. Now, similarly, if you are talking about the Japanese Bank for International Cooperation in Japan, uh, you know there has to be some level of um, uh, Japanese involvement in the project. So, this though this is basically is untied cover in the sense that it is not tied to equipment, uh, there are certain limitations uh, in, in, in kind of accessing this source of capital to mitigate the uh, political risk. Then we talk about the multilateral lending agencies. Uh, multilateral lending agencies apart from direct lending, they play a key role in mobilizing private sector funding for projects in developing countries. So, they play a catalytic role. If the multilateral agencies lend let us say 100 million, then they will be able to mobilize other private capital for 400 million. So, that is the kind of uh, you know leverage that they will be able to do. So, who are these multilateral lending agencies? So, there are several for example, you have organizations like the World Bank, then you have um, other World Bank agencies like the International Finance Corporation, you have um, International Development Association, then you have some of the regional development banks like the Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, European Investment Bank, Inter-American Development Bank. So, these are all essentially multilateral lending agencies. And uh, it is critical that uh, um, you know many of these multilateral agencies they actually have a relationship beyond a, beyond a particular project. right? So, most of the time these MLAs uh, multilateral agencies um, are involved with uh, you know the overall economy of the host country at many levels. Okay? So, they provide uh, support for several projects um, in, the, uh, in the host country. So, they are considered, uh, they actually have a lot of importance in, in terms of the overall uh, national development and because of that, um, they have you know access to um, you know the government at the highest level. Okay. So, should the project run into any kind of political difficulties, having an investment from multilateral agency can actually give large benefits because of the fact that uh, the multilateral agencies play an important role in the national's development. And uh, because of that, um, the kind of uh, visibility and the kind of access that they have among the country's political decision makers is, um, uh, you know, very very high. 
It has also been seen uh, in the past that um, MLAs get uh, preferred creditor status uh, when there are difficulties in repaying loans to external creditors. Then, um, you know, multilateral lending agencies get a preferred status. That is, they get paid first as compared to other uh, private lenders. So, therefore, uh, any uh, private investors which also has multilateral agencies is going to be a lot more comfortable because should the country experience any difficulties they have a good chance of you know uh, getting their capital um, earlier as compared to other projects which do not have any multilateral uh, lending. But there are um, uh, some of the concerns with the multilateral lending agencies as well uh, because most of them try and evaluate a project uh, you know whether it is appropriate or not in the wider economic context of the host country. So, it is not going to be um, with respect to any one project, but they would like to see how this project is going to impact uh, the overall economic development. So, this broader evaluation sometimes could be resented by the host country because um, they might feel that um, these agencies are trying to play into the wider uh, economic and political uh, scenario of the host country. Okay. They may be seen as interference, it can be seen as some form of very soft intrusion into the um, decision making of the host country. Now, as far as the lenders are concerned, uh, the objectives of uh, multilateral agencies are very different as compared to some of the private uh, lenders. So, many of these multilateral agencies, if the project is undergoing difficulties, uh, they may be willing to restructure their debt because of the fact that the potential benefits of a project um, uh, can be much larger um, at a later date. So, they may be willing to extend their term of the loan, they may be willing to subsidize um, the interest rates and so on and so forth. But then some of this might not be acceptable for the private lenders. Private lenders might not have, uh, 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 might not have anything uh, beyond uh, that particular project or an investment. So, therefore, um, they may not be comfortable with some of these strategies such as extending the term loans and so on. So, the next organization that we will have to discuss is um, an organization called MIGA. This is a Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. So, this is, a, this is an agency set up by the World Bank uh, in 1988 uh, to encourage a private sector investment in developing countries. Um, and the objective of this organization is essentially to provide uh, political cover uh, to lenders and investors. In fact, if you look at um, um, World Bank, um, different World Bank agencies, MIGA is the only agency which does not provide any funding assistance. The role of MIGA is only to provide um, guarantee against political risk. That means, it actually involves no funding at all except to provide a guarantee to the private, uh, private investors. So, what does it cover? Um, it covers both equity and debt. So, therefore, uh, this guarantee is going to be applicable both for project investors as well as the uh, project lenders. It provides for up to 95 percent of the scheduled payments of loan interest and principal. So, like the export credit agencies, 5 percent of the risk will have to be borne by the lenders. And in terms of equity, the total equity value at risk is provided for under the uh, guarantee. So, obviously, um, you know this guarantee is not a blanket guarantee or this is does not provide for any blanket insurance. There are insurance limits that exist per project. Let us say for example, if the project is 500 million, you cannot actually take an insurance protection for the entire 500 million. You could probably get insurance protection for 100 million or it could be for 150 million. So, these uh, um, limits keep changing um, over time and uh, it is very important for the project company to be up to date in terms of what are the uh, current limits. And it also uh, limited at the host country level. For example, uh, the maximum uh, guarantee that would be provided by MIGA at uh, the host country level could be let us say 500 million. So, even though there may be more projects and uh, if the total insurance coverage guarantees provided to MIGA exceeds the host country level, then it may not be possible to actually get the guarantee from MIGA for a future project. Okay, till the insurance, um, till the pro till the insurance, till the projects are released from uh, some of the uh, mega insurance covers. And obviously, the, this guarantee does not come free. Uh, the private investors will have to pay some kind of insurance premium. These are in the range of um, 5 to uh, 0.5 to 1.75 percent per annum on the amounts covered. Okay. What are the risks that are covered? Um, the common risks that are covered include currency convertibility and transfer. It also covers for expropriation, uh, including some elements of creeping expropriation. 
and uh, it also covers for civil disturbance, it covers for sabotage, terrorism and acts of war and uh, it also covers for the breach of contract by the host government. Okay. So, so, whenever we talked about um, a breach of contract by the host government, we also remember talked about the dispute resolution mechanism. That means, there is, um, there is a litigation, there is an arbitration mechanism under which the breach of um, contractor will be you know arbit arbit arbitrated. Okay. So, the question that you may ask is uh, when you actually have an arbitration mechanism, why should we actually guarantee for uh, a breach of contract? Okay. Now, the arbitration mechanism um, does not uh, abide, it is not uh, you know the host country need not abide by um, the arbitration mechanism particularly if the arbitration uh, decision is unfavorable to the host country, you know it is um, legally not bound that it has to honor the uh, terms of the arbitration. Okay. So, in case if there is a dispute resolution mechanism and if the mechanism has been in favor of the project company, then the host government uh, will have to make some payment um, for the project company. But if the payment is not received from the host government, then how do we actually cover for the risk? So, MIGA actually provides uh, for this kind of risk coverage when there has been a, you know, a favorable dispute resolution uh, in terms of the project company, but the government or the host country has not honored the arbitration award and it has not made the payment to the project company. In that case, the guarantee from the MIGA can be used to recover the cost. And the fourth way of uh, mitigating political risk is your uh, private sector insurance. Uh, now, private sector insurance uh, in political risk um, initially uh, did not have a big role because of the fact that most of uh, you know the acts are beyond the control of the private sector the role of uh, private sector insurance has been uh, very limited. But today, um, uh, there are several private sector insurers uh, which are offering political risk coverage because you know, the insurance industry has actually uh, been able to develop various actuarial models so that they can um, most accurately evaluate and assess the political risk that each of the projects might face. And because of that, they will be able to offer uh, various um, you know, insurance protection uh, for uh, the project companies. You know, uh, at last count, there were more than 20 companies which are offering some kind of political risk coverage. Some of the examples include AIG, Lloyds, Swiss Re, uh, which actually provide some form of political risk, uh, political risk insurance. Okay. As in the case of um, uh, that we see, uh, what we see export crediting agencies are MIGA, uh, the investors would be required uh, to retain some of the insured risk. That is, uh, the insurance will not provide for 100% um, of the insurance coverage. Let us say for example, the project is uh, 1000 crores and the private sector insurance will be willing to provide political risk insurance for about 150 crores. So, out of the risk coverage of 150 crores, the private investors might have to retain 5% or 10% and the remaining would be absorbed and the remaining would be uh, covered under the uh, private sector insurance. And there is a important difference between uh, you know getting political risk insurance from the private sector and the public sector like the export credit rating agencies or the multilateral banks. Now, whenever we have uh, political risk coverage from public sector insurance, uh, they generally require that the presence, their presence in the transaction is publicly known. So, this World Bank would like to know that World Bank is providing some funding for the project and MIGA would like to know that the political risk of, uh, of the project is being guaranteed by MIGA and so on. But when we actually have private insurance, they make it a condition that uh, the insurance, uh, the existence of the insurance is not revealed. It is simply because of the fact that um, they do not want uh, people to, they do not want investors uh, not properly performing their duties and uh, they, uh, they do not want people to know that um, that insurance exists so that any loss can be actually passed on to the uh, private insurance. So, there is a difference uh, in the way in which uh, both the insurance uh, players function. Okay, now, we have come to the end of this lecture and um, the questions for this lecture are two. Um, the first question is, um, we talked about political risk insurance. Now, who should actually take political risk insurance? Should the political risk insurance be taken only by lenders or should the risk insurance also be taken by the equity investors? Um, second question is, um, 
can you actually develop a general framework uh, for risk management based on the various contracting and insurance tools that we have seen so far. Remember, we talked about a whole lot of uh, strategies by which we can manage uh, the project risk. Broadly, this can be classified as uh, contracts and insurance. Now, can we actually develop a framework uh, which will kind of give us uh, some indication as to when do we actually go for contracts and when do we actually go for insurance. So, think about it and we will discuss it in the next lecture.